I'm Maria Shimkali and the Vice Chair of Pennsylvania Film Industry Association. And I'm super excited because we have amazing guests here today. We have David Diamond and we have David Weissman, who you all know by their fantastic films, The Family Man with Nicolas Cage and my personal favorite, Old Dogs, with John Travolta and Robin Williams. And I'm truly grateful that you are ready to share your knowledge and that you are ready to share your path with those who are at the beginning of it. So let's get started. And of course, the first question is, how did you get started in the industry? Well, you have to go back quite a few years, Maria, for that. <laughs> uh, we actually grew up together. Uh, we went to high school together uh, in the suburbs outside of Philadelphia. And uh, you could say that our introduction to the movie business was the movies we were you know just two idiot kids who were in love with the movies and uh you know we were i think one day what was our record how many movies did we see in a day david five in a day five in, a day. Five in the theaters in a in day the we, we were trying for that that included a midnight showing of um woodstock, uh, woodstock. yeah uh, Martin Scorsese's amazing documentary about Woodstock. Most of your audience probably have never even heard of Woodstock. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, like a lot of kids from Philadelphia who loved the movies, you know, we didn't have any exposure to the entertainment industry. Uh, you know, we just thought, oh, they're the movies. We didn't know they were written or there were people who did it or people whose jobs were to write movies and direct movies and produce movies. Um, until one of us went to uh, film school. So that was Dave. Uh, he uh, went to college at NYU and uh, transferred into, I guess, um, started studying at the Cinema Studies program there. And, um, you know, I was in college actually abroad at the time in Israel and then ended up graduating from University of Michigan. And uh, we um, sort of rekindled our love with the movies at that time. Uh, and Dave, um, I think as his in his senior year or junior year, was it your senior year you got an internship with a, a real film company? Yeah, I started working for a producer first in New York. And then after I graduated, had the opportunity to go with that company to LA. So that was sort of, uh, I mean, that was uh, in a way the the pre-beginning because it wasn't the beginning of writing. It was just the beginning of being exposed to the business. Yeah. Um, but, but actually what happened was David quit that cushy job in the industry to become a writer. And uh, I was in grad school in Madison at the time. And um, he came out to write his first script and at the end of that process, we decided, hey, let's write a script together. And we actually started working together. And that was really the beginning of our creative partnership um, that uh, morphed. In, I, I went back to graduate school, continued doing some film writing. He, of course, continued doing film writing and moved back to L.A. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, we decided, hey, if we're really going to make a go of this, I have to leave graduate school and move out to L.A. And we have to really make a go of it. And, um, you know, David promised me that we would be fabulously successful within a year, um, that he broke that promise. Uh, <laughs> it took us a couple of years to become successful at all. And, and certainly initially it wasn't fabulously successful, but ultimately he did deliver on that promise. And our film career was was born uh, then. Um, and that's our that's the basic story. You know, I mean, the lesson is. At some point, you kind of have to move out to LA. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a question comes out from, from that story. And I think it's a burning question for, for many uh, aspiring filmmakers. School or no school? Do you think? <laughs> if you're in a partnership, one of you can go to school and spend the money and one of you doesn't have to. Okay, uh -huh. that works. But, but ultimately, you think that at least one in the partnership has to go to school? Yes. No, I, I don't think that there's uh, one answer to that question. I don't think it's a one size fits all thing. I think if you have a burning desire to go to film school and you have 
the capacity to go to film school and the opportunity, go to film school. Yeah. There's, uh, in a way, I think the best thing that film school offers is the opportunity to um, meet and collaborate with other students who have the same passion you have. And a lot of times what happens if you're fortunate um, and at a good place is people pursue it after they graduate. And, you know, you've already already part of a community of people that um, you work with and are in conversation with. And that creates all sorts of opportunities and beyond just like practical professional opportunities, it gives you people to talk to because it's hard. You know, I mean, uh, people don't tend to be successful and start making a living immediately. And, you know, you go to film school and you meet people who are pursuing this and it's difficult and, uh, you know, you support each other. So that's one of the advantages, but it's it's certainly not necessary. And uh, it's not, you know, what do they say in the disclaimers of financial commercials? It's not like a uh, predictor of success, like, you know. I don't I, I agree. I don't think it's a predictor of success at all. I think what Dave said is absolutely right. It it could create your first network, which is which is amazing to have. And, you know, uh, but, you know, it depends. Listen, if you grew up out here and one of your parents was a famous writer or director, obviously, you know, you're going to have a very different beginning. Uh, and And by the way, there are quite a few people out here who that 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 is their story and they have a leg up on everybody else. So could film school give you a leg up? Maybe. But also coming out here and just working in the business could give you a leg up. So, you know, you kind of have to decide what's best for you. Yeah. Thank you. And now to the screenwriting. Uh, what are the key characteristics of a successful screenplay? And uh, how do you make your screenplay stand out among others because we always hear about those screenplays that took an experimental approach and wow this is something so new but it's so scary because it might not work out so how do you make your screenplay stand out while still following certain standards and what are those must follow standards so I mean, I think usually when people talk about must follow standards, I think usually they're talking about structure, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a structure that I mean, we write commercial movies. We write like mostly studio movies. That's our orientation. We don't do experimental stuff. We don't do avant-garde stuff. So that's where we're coming from. I suspect people who are looking for avant-garde advice are not coming to this masterclass from the writers of Old Dogs. But um, you know, I think structure is really important. It's like uh, if you were renting an apartment or looking to buy a house, you wouldn't buy a house without a bathroom and a kitchen um, and closets and bedrooms. There are certain expectations that we have. And the same thing is true of stories. There are expectations we have of stories. There are emotional needs that we have when we watch them. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of that is reflected in structure. I think that um, sometimes people, uh, if they're coming from a, a skeptical place, might see it as a cage to get locked in, and that means it's a formula. Uh, and I think that um, it's not true. Structure is really a tool, and it's a symptom of good storytelling. So, um, you know, you want your house to have a bathroom and a kitchen and closets and a bedroom. But that doesn't mean that everyone looks the same, right? We all know that. And an architect and a designer can come in and take the same ingredients and create something very different from it and very distinct and very beautiful. And so I think that's the idea, you know, whether you're a fan of Charlie Kaufman, uh, which I love Charlie Kaufman. I think he's a very inventive, creative writer. And uh, I'm talking about the, the writer of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and other interesting sort of offbeat movies, but those movies have three act structure too. Um, he plays with it a little bit. He's very creative, but they all have three act structure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that you want to deliver on the conventions of screenwriting and the genre that you're working in. And you also want to contribute something fresh and, um, and exciting and entertaining. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
uh, and how do you improve as a writer uh, given that it's such a subjective field and uh, when, whenever writers are starting out uh, I mean still uh, many many writers who have already been in the field do that too but especially those who are just starting out getting uh, analysis of the script, evaluation, script coverage, all that in order to understand whether your script is really working or you just you're in love with your script. Uh, but the, if you're getting it from several different sources, even if you go on blacklist and you get several evaluations, they are going to differ. So how do you decide which of the opinions to follow, given that these are all professionals in the field who are giving that opinion? But they still differ. This yeah. is something. That, that, yeah, I think this is an area that's sort of changed a little bit. It doesn't change your question or the, or the response really to your question. But I think that the the um, the situation has changed from when we were coming up. You know, when we first started, there was no blacklist, yeah. right? And um, I think like the Nichols competition was a thing that's that's been around for a long time and a couple of the others, but it was, you didn't come up by like submitting your screenplay to competitions and, and you didn't get coverage online. And so you didn't have as much access to all of these different voices from people you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, most often you got feedback from your friends and you got <laughs> feedback from colleagues um, who you knew and had relationships with, which was always really valuable. But, you know, your question is what happens when you get feedback, whether you know the person or not, like, how do you decide what do I, what am I going to follow? And what am I not going to follow? Right. Yeah. That's what you're yeah. asking. I think, you know, if you're writing what you're writing just to satisfy each individual you encounter along the way, you're going to be writing forever. And the thing you're writing is going to be a total mess, right? Like, you have to have an idea of what your character is about, what your story is about. Um, you know, uh, you need to know these things. And when you get feedback, the feedback that helps you improve the thing you're working on, the feedback that helps you clarify your characters and your theme and your story and uh, allow people to understand better what it is you're trying to do, that's feedback that's that's really worth listening to and following. Someone gives you feedback and it sounds to you like they're talking about a completely different movie. Well, you know, maybe not not so much. But I, I think that every note that you get is good information to have. You know, the uh, there are not a lot of hard and fast rules of screenwriting, but I think that one rule that everybody can agree on is don't lose the reader. Right, like uh, whether it's on page three or page sixty-three, you don't want someone to toss your script across the floor. So, if someone reads your script and they have a response, whether their solution is the right solution or not, is sort of beside the point. If they say, you know, you lost me here, it's worth thinking about it. But you're not writing your script to please that one particular person. You're just trying to gather the information and do the best you can with it. Mm -hmm. We we actually we actually wrote a book about it uh, mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, we wrote a book called Bulletproof, um, writing scripts that don't get shot. That oh, he has it. <laughs> I, I have it, you know, know with a dog ear. And you know, here's the thing: is like um, you have to look at the incentive of the person reading your script. You know, everybody has concentric circles of readers, right? And and these days because of, of the online writing community and because of the sort of industry that's kind of risen up around new uh, screenwriters, mm -hmm. you have options that we didn't have. But you also have to look at those options with the right attitude. And, and, and you know, your inner circle of readers, your closest creative contacts, you, you take those notes with, with a certain kind of... Um, I think value because those are people who aren't going to get anything from you, right? They're not being paid. They're not, you know, these are people that are invested in you. So, you know, you take it with that attitude. And then the next circle, you, you know, those are people that are maybe being paid to give you insight, still valuable, but maybe not in the same way. And then ultimately 
you know, you have to look at the circle of people who um, may actually get paid because of you. And that's the most valuable advice, right? Because those are the people that will be invested in you economically. And, um, and they're going to tell you the real truth because they need to make money off of you. Agents, lawyers, managers, producers, directors, actors. Those are the people who are invested in you in a way that uh, are much more closely aligned with the actual interests of you and your script. Yeah. And now that you've brought up agents and managers, uh, what are some tips? It's uh, one of the hardest things to do to move from just trying to, you know, open yeah. doors yourself to finally getting someone who believes in you. So what are some ways for the aspiring writers to get an agent or a manager? Well, there's a secret to it. Um, and I'm going to reveal the secret. And uh, it's probably going to blow the mind of a lot of the people that are watching this. And the secret is this. Write a great script. <laughs> Just write a great script. Uh, that's all you need to do. Uh, I don't think there's anything bigger or more involved than that in the process. How do you get people to read it, though, given so many no unsolicited submissions situation? That's a well, great question. If it's yeah, great I think, first of all, um, everybody, everybody, most people, probably ourselves included 30 years ago, want to get to the answer to the second question before they get to the answer to the first one. Mm -hmm. And the truth is there's no way around the first one. And everyone you ask that question to, certainly every, I think probably, I'd be curious, Maria, you talk to people in the business all the time doing these master classes. I'd be curious if you've ever got an answer to that question that was different from what David just said. You know, if you ask an agent or a producer, they're all gonna say, write a great script. Um, and, uh, you know, writing a great script that doesn't mean you have to write Citizen Kane or Chinatown or the usual suspects or whatever this year's example of that is. It means uh, you have to write a script that has something in it for all the people who are gonna be involved in making it. The mm -hmm. producer, the director, the actor, you, know, you have to write something that other people are going to be invested in. Um, so, okay, you've written that script. Now, what are you going to do? You you want the answer to the second question, <laughs> right? So I think that, uh, quite frankly, it's harder when you're not in Los Angeles or maybe New York. I think it's harder when you're not in the place where um, people are making movies and the people who make movies are working um, because I think that just practically speaking in terms of getting attention um, to your script from people in the business, you need to have relationships with those people. You know, you can't approach them cold. You can't say, I'm writing to you from, you know, the suburbs of Philadelphia, and this is my idea. Will you read my screenplay? It's probably not going to work very well. Um, and, you know, even with screenplay competitions and things like that, again, with the exception of, of just a few, uh, people who are really in a position to be helpful to you don't really care that much about who wins sort of smaller screenplay competitions, things like that, local competitions. Mm -hmm. So the way we got an agent, which I think is probably still the way to get a manager and agent, is to be working in some capacity in the movie or TV business and to meet people who are in that business and to develop relationships relationships with them based on the quality of the work you do, even if it's not the writing work, mm -hmm. you know, based on the quality of the work you do and your commitment. And those people will say to you, when you have something, I'd like to read it. That's what happens. Yeah. And, and then it's up to you to be sort of, to be very judicious about what you give them. And how many times you give people like that a screenplay? You can't just inundate them with, you know, multiple drafts of a script or you didn't like the last one. How about this one? It doesn't work like that. So you have to be really respectful of people's time and, and their generosity. And um, 
that would be, you know, my reluctant answer to the second question, because I, I really think that all that matters is the truth is you're ready to get an agent when the agent thinks you're ready to get an agent, not when you think you're ready to get it. You know, we all think we're, I need an agent, I need a manager. And um, it's totally understandable to be anxious to be at that stage. But the truth is, when you really need one, it's amazing how quickly they find you, hmm. right? Because yeah. they, they want to discover a new voice. They genuinely do. They want to break a new voice and they want to sell stuff and get stuff made. If you've written that script, they will find you. How did you feel that? How did you know inside, like, this is it? That's the one. We Well, we had a, actually a pretty interesting experience with getting our first agent, which mm -hmm. was the script that we were sending out to try to hook an agent was, um, it wasn't the script that eventually really launched our career. Mm -hmm. uh, it was... It was it was interesting and fun and different and maybe attention grabbing. Um, it was called People of Girth, and it was about um, four angry fat people that take over a twenty four hour all you can eat buffet and hold the manager hostage. And it was you know sort of everything you would expect of that crazy idea. And we sent it out. I think we had 20 contacts, agent submission contacts, somehow that we gathered over the years. And 19 of them passed, some angrily. Um, <laughs> but one agent said to us, hey, uh, this is this is kind of fun and interesting. You know, I don't, I, I you know, maybe I could send this out and 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 maybe. Maybe you could get a few meetings out of it or whatever, because the writing is kind of cool and it's whatever, and a unique idea. But I don't think that's the way to launch a career. I think unique guys need to write um, a spec that's going to really kind of get out there and get you some attention and you're going to make a splash. And, you know, this guy who was sort of uh, a guy who had the skills and the talent to, to launch a career, but he was just starting out on his own also. He'd been working for a bigger company. And we got lucky because we found a guy who was willing to invest himself a little bit in us, mm -hmm. right? So he said, hey, let's let's sit down and you can give me some of your other ideas and maybe I can see if one of them maybe has that. Well, of course, as the eager young writers that we were, within you know 48 hours, we had a list of 20 ideas. <laughs> <laughs> this don't do that we did it and you know we sat down with him and he and there was one idea that he said oh that one maybe has some potential you know kind of the market seems to want something like that why don't you work on that one well of course we went away and you know within six weeks we had written a spec on this idea and we sent it to him and um you know his response was tepid and he said, oh, I don't know. He had a few notes. He had a few things. We're like, oh, you know, within another four weeks, we'd completely rewritten it again. And just responding to his notes. And he's like, guys, maybe this isn't the one. And that was not something we were prepared to he hear. So we went away and we asked ourselves, okay, it was, it was a, a script with a with a 12-year-old lead. And those movies were getting made at the time, sort of in the wake of Home Alone. Mm -hmm. And we went away to Vegas, I think, and as we would we would do uh, when we needed some creative inspiration. And we asked ourselves a question that ended up changing the course of our career. And the question was, OK, we know how Diamond and Weissman would do this idea badly. <laughs> um, but we asked, how would Disney do this idea? In other words, we asked, how would the marketplace want this idea to be done. And when we asked ourselves that question, we suddenly shifted our perspective from, you know, how two knuckleheads from Philadelphia would write a script to how a couple of professional screenwriters would deliver a script to a company like Disney that was doing movies around, you know, a, a 12 year old lead. Mm -hmm. And when we answered that question, we rewrote it in an even shorter time, send it to this agent who on the last draft had said, maybe this isn't the one. And when he saw and read that script, he said, okay, this is the one. And wow. that was our journey. That was our story. Uh, that subtle shift in perspective to how would 
the movie business want to see this script rather than how would you want to do this script changed everything for us. Yeah. Now that's that's an amazing way to look at it. How does your art meet the business and combine it yeah. together? I think that actually leads us to another question. And that was about learning from the masterpieces that were made before. But some of them, I mean, they're decades, decades old and they're still loved dearly by people. But do, for those who are learning from the masterpieces, should they still learn from those older films or should they stick to something that sells today? How do you find that balance? Your goal is the same, which is to write a great script. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that you, uh, you take your mentors wherever you can find them, mm -hmm. right? Like if you were looking for life advice, you could look for someone who's extremely successful right now. They might be a little full of themselves. You could talk to someone who's a little bit older and wiser and, uh, you know, you get something valuable from both. I would never abandon the masterpieces. The masterpieces are masterpieces for a reason, and you should take whatever you can learn from them. And, um, you know, the stuff that's working now, you should learn from that too. I mean, I, I, I don't think... I don't think either of us would suggest that you should write primarily for the marketplace because the marketplace is constantly changing. So, you know, even if you write your script relatively quickly and everything goes smoothly and you actually get it made like pretty much right away, by the time that movie comes out, the marketplace may well have shifted. So there is a difference between, you know, what David was saying, like, how would Disney look at it? Uh, that's a good question to ask, you know, who makes this kind of movie and what do those movies look like? And is the way that I'm thinking about this in any way compatible with how they actually look when they come out at the end? That's like a good question to ask and can be very helpful, very instructive. But you know, if you're just trying to replicate something that worked this year, next year is going to look very, very different. So I, you know, I think you take whatever um, guidance and uh, whatever insight you can from wherever you can get and try to write the absolute best version of the script that you have, something that, um, you know, is fresh and interesting and entertaining and, and go with that. Mm -hmm. And once you've written something that you've gotten good feedback on, you're passionate about, you feel like it does reflect uh, what the industry needs. What is the key? Actually, I'll, I'll ask it in two parts of the question. One is if you don't yet have an agent or a manager, what are some ways of attracting producers possibly to kind of give yourself a start in the industry? And another one, whether you do have an agent or manager or don't yet, what is the key? Uh, because we all know that money is not, finding budget is not the only thing in attracting name talent. What is the key to attracting name talent besides budget to your script? Writing a great role. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, look, the people you want, if you're writing studio movies, mm -hmm. Uh, or you're writing television and you want to write like, you know, for a network, or you want to write for HBO or Netflix or whatever, the roles you're writing are um, played by actors who have choices. Mm -hmm. They're not desperate. So even the budget is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. right? They actually have to want to do the job. It just goes back to what David was saying earlier. You have to create this whole thing, it's like, it is a, you're following a creative impulse, you're doing creative work in a creative way. And when it's done, what you have to do, essentially, what your product has to do is create opportunities for other people yeah. that they want to take advantage of. Is this a script that a director is going to read and say, oh, I, this world is fantastic. I've always wanted to do something, you know, in this in this world. And what a great compelling story. And not only that, 
I'm going to cast these roles. It's going to be great. I'm going to get this actor and that actor. And those actors are going to do it because those roles provide them with opportunities that whether they knew it or not, they'd always wanted. They haven't done it before. It's a great opportunity for them. That's why stuff happens. So I know people might want the answer like, here's the yellow brick road and here are the breadcrumbs and all you have to do is follow the yellow brick road and pick up the breadcrumbs. But these are the breadcrumbs. You have to write a great script. You have to write great characters. You have to write a world that people are interested in and want to explore creatively themselves. That's kind of how it works. And in terms of the breadcrumbs, um and the yellow brick road it goes back to what we were saying before it's a relationship driven business and you find yourself with access to people when they know or hear about you that you're a good worker that you know that you do good work you're committed you're dedicated and um opportunities can find you that way. They can pre present themselves. Mm -hmm. that way. I, I just just adding to that because I think that's he's exactly right. Um, you know, it puts screenwriters in an enviable position yeah. because um, you know a screenwriter can write that thing that's going to be a vehicle for somebody else's opportunity, and nobody else in the business can do that. Um, you know, the, the the screenwriter has a lot of power, a lot of, uh, because the screenwriter initiates and there is a cascade of opportunity down the line with a script that truly is something special, right? You're creating opportunities for actors, directors, producers, studio executives, agents, managers, lawyers, everybody. It it's, it's really all goes, flows from one source. But that's also an awesome, awesome responsibility because the barriers to entry in screenwriting are the highest of any other piece of the of the, of the movie business. You know, it's 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 by its nature gatekeeping, right? Because the screen the screenplay is gonna is gonna take on all these other um, uh, roles along the way. It's really very difficult to get your screenplay into a position where it can get made. They don't make a lot of movies. Uh, they never made a lot of movies. So, uh, but, you know, I do think there's something empowering in it. And I think you, you can, you know, you can tell by, you know, how many people are interested in doing it that, um, you know, it's not bullshit. It's, it's true. Yeah. It starts with the script. Mm-hmm. And I think that takes us to the pitching question. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to put together a pitch. It's hard to present a pitch. It, it's it's just difficult. What have you found effective? I, I'm sure you've done plenty. So uh, you have experience and you've noticed what worked with studio executives, what hasn't worked, what you've experimented with that you thought would work and maybe wasn't really good. So any advice in that field that you could share? Yeah, I mean, we uh, we've had like some very nice success with pitches. The Family mm -hmm. Man started with a pitch. When in Rome started with a pitch. Mm -hmm. Old Dogs was a pitch. Mm -hmm. So um, we've done well with pitches. We've also pitched ideas that have not sold. Um, I think that uh, the best thing that you can do in a pitch is present it in a way that gives the person listening to it an experience similar to what an audience member is going to experience when they see the movie, just in a much more compressed period of time, right? So uh, the other piece of advice I would give is don't take too long, um, especially after lunch, because, you know, people get tired and they're busy and they hear a lot of pitches and uh, and if yours isn't working, you know, they don't want to be sitting there for too long listening to it. But I, I think that the pitches that are most effective are the ones that make the people hearing them feel like, wow, 
I feel like I've just seen this movie. It only took 15 to 22 minutes, but I feel like I've just seen this movie and it was wonderful. I, I was moved by it. I laughed. It was scary, whatever kind of movie you're pitching. And not only that, but I feel like I know how I could put this movie together. I feel like I know how I could sell this movie, how I could market this movie. Um, I think that's how uh, I think that's how you do a pitch. I think it's how you write a script mm -hmm. too. You want people to finish reading a script. You hope they get to the last page, and that when they're done, they feel like, "Oh my God, I I feel like I just saw this movie and it was wonderful. It was so good. I'm going to recommend it to so and so in the same way that someone would recommend a movie that they just saw to a friend or you know someone they work with. That's what you're trying to do." Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what are the ways to deal with the ups and downs of this career? Like you said, some pitches didn't go through and it's, you know, months, sometimes years of work that you put into those scripts and uh, it just yeah. not, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't uh, get recognized and you're still passionate about it. So how do you deal with this, you know, from euphoric, I'm a genius to the, you know, I'm never going to make it in this industry feeling. <laughs> Um, you know, you get lucky by, you know, having your best friend as your writing partner and having a 30 year career together. That's, that's, you know, it's lonely, right? Writing is a pretty lonely business unless you, you know, you either have a partner or a network of, you know, um, people who are your support. But, you know, I tell everybody, and we do this a lot we try, you know, whenever anybody comes to us and says, will you have a cup of coffee with, it with me? Will you, you know, I'm starting out. We do it because we feel like it's our responsibility to do it. And I think, you know, we say to everybody, this is, this is a hard job. It's a hard job because of those ups and downs. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, much easier obviously to go through the ups than it is to go through the downs, but, um, you know, you're really, you're, you're really tested by the downs and that's, and that's where, you know, it shows whether you have what it takes to keep doing this because you're doing something creative. You're living a creative life. It's a, an amazing, wonderful, wonderful thing, but you know, it's, it, it's not, um, it's not easy and it's not for the faint of heart, you know, establish, a network of people who you can count on to be supportive, not just creatively, but also supportive of your dreams and your hopes. Um, you know, don't try to do it alone. It's it's not good. Do it with other people who are, are going through the same thing. I mean, if all of your friends, you know, have jobs at investment banks and you're the only person in a creative field, that's going to be really hard because they're going to be talking about their bonuses and their you know, lunches and their business trips. And you're going to be talking about, you know, how you're, you know, that you just earned $15 walking dogs. So, <laughs> I mean, make sure that your friends, at least some of them can understand what you're trying to do and how important it is. Um, and, uh, you know, turn to, turn to them for support. And I don't know, marry well, maybe I, you know, <laughs> I don't know what else to I think that's uh, tougher than making it in the industry, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, that's hard. Exactly. That's it. So, hey, we'll do another podcast. We'll do another master class of that. Because we I, both married well. I completely agree with David. I was going to say, find a friend. I mean, I, it is just, uh, you know, when I moved out to LA from New York, we were all, it was a bunch of us from school, and we were all sort of, I was, of course, the last one to earn a penny from what I was doing. Everyone else was successful so much faster than I was. But uh, we still, you know, went out and drank together every week and and they got it. And having a friend, I think, is, uh, is essential. Having a partner, even better. The other thing I would say, which, you know, I feel like I've discovered maybe later in life, having continued to go through successes and setbacks professionally, um, don't confuse what you do with who you are you know if your identity is so completely wrapped up in what you're doing in screenwriting i'm a screenwriter i'm a screenwriter well then when you experience setbacks 
as a screenwriter, they affect you so deeply personally. It's so difficult and so much harder to overcome. When you recognize that screenwriting is what you do and you have a setback, well, that's a bad day at the office, right? A bad week at the office. That's a that's an obstacle and obstacles can be overcome. It's not an assault on you know who you are as, as a human being. So it's all really part of the same thing, right? Like have friends, appreciate your family, you know, anyone you're in a relationship with, those things are super important and you're trying to do something that's challenging and they're going to be good days and bad days and, you know, projects that go well and projects that go south. It happens even after you get multi-picture deals. It happens after you achieve your dreams. It still happens over and over and over again. Projects come together with an actor or with a director. You think it's the best thing you've ever written. This is going to be your moment. And then it all falls apart. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. And the stuff, even if you have a wonderful career, as we have been so fortunate to have, you know, you might feel at the beginning, middle and end of it, like the best thing you ever wrote never got out there. That can happen too, you know? So uh, you need to have a full life. You really need to have a full life. This shouldn't be everything. You know, it's true that we, we've we had two greenlit movies ungreenlit, which I think is a lot for writers. Yeah. I wonder if it is. I mean, I think you do Maybe something long enough. I, I think it's- But I two legit greenlit movies, they're spending money on the movie, they're ready to go. And then the the rug is the plug is pulled. So that I mean, you have to you got to be pretty tough to get yeah. through these these the downs. But you know, if we had because we had each other, we got through it. Yeah. And at least we have the old dogs residuals. <laughs> That's right. So back to the not even back to we're still on it the creative partnership. Uh, what is the key? to a successful, effective, uh, positive, creative partnership. And uh, of course, uh, you know, two separate minds, feelings, emotions, ideas, sometimes they clash. And sometimes you can be both passionate about different endings, different character. This character is unnecessary. This character makes the plot. Things happen. It's creative. It's subjective. How do you deal with it? I feel like this is like the newlywed game. I, I wonder <laughs> if we're going to come up with this. <laughs> This could be very, this could be the end of the partnership. Oh my, all right, we're delivering this question. <laughs> very high. I, well, I Love have your partner, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Get a new partner. Yeah. In the rear. Um, yeah, so we'll edit that out. Um, I mean, I, I have two, two thoughts on this question. By the way, the audience has no idea what the Newlywood game is. And That's true, uh, that yeah. I've Thank really, you. I've dated not only us, I've dated our parents, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, look, you know, we, I think we can only really speak to our own experience. Um, as David said, you know, we're, we're best friends from like when we were teenagers. Yeah. So uh, one lesson we've learned, you know, over and over, and I think we don't need to learn it anymore, is we put our relationship with each other ahead of any particular project or script or or you know creative issue or whatever that's that's sort of the first thing so um you know some partnerships are very situational you're just coming together to write one specific screenplay and you don't necessarily have an intention of being partners after that maybe and that is potentially another thing but you're still working with somebody else and you still have to be in relationship with that person and uh, and respect them. And uh, so uh, putting the putting the relationship first is is the first thing. And the second thing, which is maybe a better answer than the first answer, is you have to recognize that you're not um, you're not in a tug of war with each other. Right. There's so many things that can get in the way of making progress. And they're all understandable, right? There's pride and stubbornness, and those things are are not so great. Um, or conviction, which is can be a good thing, but 
you're not in a tug of war with the pe person you're working with. You're in a tug of war together with the idea you're working on. So the more you can recognize that and sort of move to that, it's very natural, as you say, for you're going to have differences of opinion. You're going to see things differently. You're going to come at things differently. That's just all part of it. But I think that if you, uh, and anyone you're working with, it's not just writing partners, it's also directors and producers, sure. um, anyone you're working with, the idea is this is a team and the team shares a mission and uh, it's all about the mission. It's all about the goal. If you're, you know, getting in each other's way, then what chance do you have? So that would be my, my thought. Mm -hmm. You actually brought up uh, working with directors, producers, and uh, the rest of the creative team. And uh, I think that's also a big challenge for many. And we know many famous stories where screenwriters would just not agree on making any changes and uh, walk away. And eventually they did uh, get the success they wanted. But again, we're always talking about the balance. Where do you find that balance where you agree to let go of some parts that you thought really like made that story and where do you fight for it um you know i no one really knows the answer to that question until your every situation is different i would say you know the rules of thumb you know of course if you're a genius you don't have to listen to any of this you know if you're a genius go walk away and and you know somebody else will want to do your work of genius if you're like the rest of us i think that every note has to be respected at the very least with the intention of the note in mind um and and you know studio executives and directors and producers everybody's human so there's a tendency everybody wants to fix a problem but usually the screenwriter usually i think the screenwriter probably knows best how to fix the problem but the screenwriter is mostly awful at identifying the problem um because when we wrote the script we thought it was done and i don't know anybody who sent out a script who didn't think it was done so, you know, we're starting off thinking this work is complete. And so you have all these other people telling you, well, it's not complete because here is my thought. I would say, look at the intent behind the thought. Look at look at what they're saying. Not necessarily how they're saying to fix it, but look at what they're saying. It's It's usually reflects, you know, something that maybe needs addressing uh, and take your ego out of it and look at it that way. You know, and then if you if you can't figure out how to fix it, you know, include the the regular, you know, the, everybody else in the, you know, in the trenches with you, their voices may help you too. But you know, listen. Yeah, and uh, have you had situations where again these are situations we read about them here, but have you had situations already on set when there's an actor? Who just keeps on changing his or her lines, and then you're like, no, that is not yeah. my way around. What are you killing? Well, it? we've been lucky. We've been lucky because we worked with a lot of genius actors, and when they change lines, they're usually a lot better. Okay. Uh, so, but <laughs> uh, yeah, we've had we've had situation many situations like that, and you know, you're making a movie. It's a collaboration. Yeah. You know, if you don't like an actor changing your lines, go write a play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so you so your advice is to trust the process and the unity of that collaboration and uh, not not fight because it's you know it's your own baby that you created, but once you put it into other people's think, hands, you, yeah. I think you do everything you can possibly do to make the script better and make the movie better. And to the extent you can collaborate with other people to do that, that's always great. And then when there are people who are very insistent on doing things a certain way and you think that it's counterproductive, you think it's going to detract, then you have a practical decision to make, right? You can walk away. You can, you can quit. Um, you can do that. Uh, you can do your best to argue and make, make your case. 
which you probably should do your best respectfully to do that. And if they're not going to listen, then you have to decide. I'm just, you know, I, I'm going to put, it's better for me to stay involved with this mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to stay on. Uh, and if you can't take it, then you can leave. But uh, it's a big deal to do that. I mean, in our, in our career, there was one time, literally one time, and David and I are, we're very collaborative and maybe collaborative to a fault. You know, honestly, because we are, first of all, we're still two kids from Philadelphia. And when we're around people who are really, really talented and you see them doing things, you see it is mind blowing how talented some of the people you might work with are. Uh, and so it's easy to sort of, you know, they come up with a suggestion just say, that's great. <laughs> you know, it must be great. They're such a genius. Um so we're very collaborative and maybe a little bit too collaborative that way, but even we have our limits. And there was one occasion on one of our movies when uh, we had a director who was, a, you know, real, by his own admission, real micromanager. And we felt like we didn't really have an opportunity to do our best work. Mm -hmm. And um, we told him we thought we'd, we'd sort of reached the end of the road wow. and we were prepared for someone else to get hired to finish the work because it was kind of soul crushing and we didn't feel like things were moving forward creatively in a, in a positive way. So that's what we decided to do. It's really only one time in our entire career that we did that. And, uh, and he came back and he apologized and asked us to continue and, and no other writers worked on that movie after us. So you know, it's a it's a judgment call. It's a personal decision. It's a collaborative business. If you're not a collaborative person, it's not the business for you. If you don't want anyone changing a word of what you've written, it's not the business for you. Uh, you should be proud of the work that you've done. You should care about it and be invested in it and try to make it as good as you possibly can, taking into account feedback that you get from other people. And uh, if you're in a bad situation, then you just have a personal judgment call to make. It's, you know, do you in your conscience. Yeah. And uh, you brought up collaboration with others a number of times on writing. Would you ever consider it, given that you already have such an established team, would you ever consider working with someone who is in the very beginning, but as you said, could be very talented and just work with them as a team on something that they've written to help them push it forward? And if yes, what would it take for someone who is in the beginning of their path to collaborate with uh, such established uh, screenwriters as yourselves? I think, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty used to the way we do what we do, how, how we do it. Um, it's not so we've we've mentored other writers, as David said, you know, we've we'll talk to pretty much anybody who reaches out to to talk to us. So we're invested in being helpful to other writers. Um, but I think I mean, there's only there are two other writers we've worked with mm -hmm. um, in our career. They're friends of ours and people who's you know, who we like and like being around and we have an idea together that seems like it could be really fun to do together. So we've done that on a couple of occasions, um, but it's really rare. And uh, it's kind of hard to imagine, certainly not without just seeing something that we absolutely mm -hmm. fell in love with and felt like, you know, we're in love with this. And uh, we have an idea how we can be helpful. I think, you know, then maybe, but that's uh, honestly, it's never mm -hmm. happened. Sure. Uh, and uh, now you brought up that you have your certain way of doing things. So what is your way of bringing the script to life from idea to the end? Do you uh, write at times when you feel inspired? Do you have a certain schedule? You know, we write on these days at this time. Do you write it all the way to the end and fly through it and then edit it afterwards or edit it every time you meet and look over it? What's your process? We wrote an entire book about it. Yeah, we, we and I love to talk about it. 
all that and we're going to share yes. it with our audience. <laughs> I love that you have it here. For a shameless plug of Bulletproof, uh, you know, I mean, really the, the inspiration of this book was just in a very plain spoken way to take people through the process that we go through when we're trying to figure out an idea and sell a movie. That's mm -hmm. that's what that is. And it includes, as David said before, seeing every phase of that process from the point of view of all of the other people who will become our future collaborators, the mm -hmm. agents and managers and producers and directors and actors and studios, executives and financiers and marketing people really seeing the whole process through all of those different lenses. That's um, that's what the book is about. And, you know, on one foot in terms of, of how we work together, just the two of us, um, we come up with an idea together and uh, we figure that out in really pretty meticulous detail. And we have found just in our the way we work that it's most helpful for one or the other of us to start writing and write all the way through a draft. And we turn pages over periodically to each other um, just to make sure, are we on the right track? And uh, and then we end up rewriting each other and ultimately revising together sort of side by side. Um, but that's kind of how we do it. But the entire process is really spelled out in detail in bulletproof and it's not an arbitrary process. We do it the way we do it, like for very specific reasons. And um yeah. Yeah. And, and where and, can our and, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say that it, you know, it's it's a process that has evolved over our career. And uh, you know, um, we figured it out what the best way for us to do it. And there are certain elements I think that we do that are universal to every screenwriter would benefit from doing certain things that way. There are other elements of it that works best for us and may not work best for every, you know, like Dave said, we tend to like to give each other the creative freedom to actually write through a draft, right? Not every writing partnership works that way, but for us, it, it, you know, it establishes a couple things. One or the other of us is probably more, um, fitting as a writer to, um, you know, to initiate the, 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 the script and write through to the end. Um, we, we try, we like to work on different kinds of movies and we each have strength as writers. So that, uh, that works well for us. It also allows, you know, each of us as writers to a little bit kind of be able to, um, you know, uh, make some mistakes, go back to that, you know, really kind of, uh, um, have a lot of freedom in the process, uh, works that works well for us, but, you know, other writing partnerships might do that particular element of it in a different way, but the prep stuff that we do that really, we have found, um, works well for us and, and would likely work well for 99% of the screenwriters out there mm -hmm. in terms of going from a notion to an idea, to a concept, to a one pager, to a three pager, to an outline, to really getting up to that point where you're ready to write. You know, it's funny, that's the fanfare, right? Is the writing, but in a way it's the easiest because if you've done the prep work up until then, that kind of naturally flows out of you. Um, but, but you have to get there. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing, just to respond to the other piece of your question about inspir inspiration versus perspiration. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, this is a job, like, you know, even before it actually becomes a job, uh, it's a job and you got to show up for work every day or certainly five days a week. Um, I think if you're sitting around waiting for inspiration, you're going to die never having finished the screenplay. Uh, it just doesn't really work like that. I mean, you know, be open to it and make the most of it when it happens. And it does happen. And it's really wonderful when you're inspired that way. It's one of the most satisfying aspects of, of this work. But the truth is, you know, writing a movie or a TV pilot or whatever, uh, it really takes a lot of work and it's wonderful, great work, 
but it's work and they mm -hmm. call it work for a reason. You got to show up every day and uh, some days you're not going to feel like it. And some days you're starting with a problem that's going to be hard to resolve and it's not going to resolve itself. You know, it's not going to resolve itself. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to have to resolve it and it might, you know, maybe you'll get lucky and it'll be resolved through inspiration, you know, go take a walk around the block and it's amazing sometimes what a little bit of fresh air can do. It really is. But, you know, sometimes you just have to kind of hammer away at it until you realize, oh, why don't we just do this? You know, um, so I yeah. think uh, inspiration is great, but it's overrated. Yeah. And David, can you please pull out the book again? You mean this book? Yes, please. Thank you. So a couple of questions. One is where can our viewers get it? And second is what kind of practical advice they are going to be able to find there to make it um, hopefully one day where you guys are? Well, first you go to your corner bookstore. <laughs> uh, no, you find it where everyone finds everything on mm -hmm. Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can find it on the publisher's website. It's Michael Weezy productions their website mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the publishers have also um save the cat and the writer's journey look they they do uh performing arts books and they do them very well and uh so you can find it on their website as well but it's certainly easy to get it on amazon and like we said before it's a this is um you know over this career as we've said now multiple times you know we've had a lot of cups of coffee with a lot of aspiring screenwriters and so um and we find that we are pretty much saying the same thing over and over and over again and this book is a product of you know those 500 to a thousand cups of coffee uh it's just pretty much you know 82 percent of what we know about screenwriting in one place uh, <laughs> the practical stuff the creative stuff as dave said how to take what is an idea you know, what is an idea? Actually, when someone says, what's your idea for a movie? What constitutes an idea? What are the essential elements of a movie idea? What do you need? Um, how does structure work? Lots of practical stuff. How do you do an outline? How do you write characters that, you know, um, that uh, come off the page? How do you write characters that actors are going to want to play? What do you do? The question, Maria, that you that you really want to know the answer to. I assume that um, a lot of people want to know the answer to it. What do you do with the script when it's done? Right. Uh, all those um, all those questions are are addressed in the book. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. And there's, and there's also a way to reach out to us. There's a way to reach out to us through the book as well. Awesome. Thank you. Amazing resource. Thank you for sharing it. And now, what are the three mistakes or lessons learned or something that you wish you knew at the beginning of your path that you now know? Now, now know. <laughs> so what are those that you can share now with those who are where you, you might, were you might, some time ago? <laughs> I get six. There are two of us. So you might get the six. Things. Six. I know. I'm doing yeah. the math. We didn't, uh, we didn't compare notes. I think one of the things, you know, I think we thought it would be easier. It's a, you know, it's, a, I think it's a little bit like marriage, you know, if, uh, if you knew how challenging it was going to be before you started, it might've, it might've scared you off, but, um, but that doesn't make it any less wonderful, you know? I mean, uh, so, um, it's, uh, it's challenging, but, uh, but but worthwhile. What yeah, I, I you know I think one of the one of the mistakes that a lot of writers make is um, you know a mistake that a lot of people make in their lives, which is they're not nice enough to themselves. You know, uh, you have to recognize from the beginning that what you're setting out to do is unusual and uh, it's not a traditional way. I mean, it's not the traditional way that most people work or, or, uh, you know, make their living. And, um, you know, you really have to sort of appreciate the gift of living a creative life. And I think one of the mistakes that I've made is sometimes I took that for granted. You know, sometimes I took it for granted and thought, uh, you know, it should be this and I should be doing this. I should be making more money. I should be doing, you know, and I didn't see that 
the joy of living a creative life was, um, you know, part of the compensation for this job. And uh, so I think you do have to kind of, you know, be nice to yourself and appreciate that, you know, what you're doing is creative and um, it's its own reward much of the time. Um, but you know. I love that answer so much more than my answer. Um, and and I have another one. I'm, I'm going to take a two over. Um I think uh, also a mistake because we grew up together and spent a lot of time laughing together as 15 year olds. We have at times over our career mistaken what amuses us <laughs> or what might be amusing to other people. And um, just sort of like expanding on that, uh, I think it is important for all writers when you're approaching a project, thinking about an idea, to really ask, is this something that is interesting only to me? Or is this something that's really going to resonate with people, you know, who don't know me and my circumstances and my family and, you know, my relationship or whatever? Uh, it's you're you're writing not just for yourself unless you are writing just for yourself, which is fine. It's a wonderful form of creative expression. But if you want to sell stuff and make stuff, you're really making it for the world, not just for yourself. So you have to find a way to give the world access to your creative vision um, and understand the difference between what might be interesting only to you and, and what you have to offer others. We, we still make that mistake all the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. It makes it fun. It does make it. Fun. It does make it fun, but uh, you'd think you would learn over the course of thirty years that um, you know something tickles us. It might not tickle everybody, but yeah, no, we still do that one all the time. But but it does make it fun, and that's and that that goes back, I think, to appreciating what's fun about this job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you guys. This was fantastic advice. And uh, I'm sure that our viewers learned a lot about the real industry and the real struggles and benefits behind those screenplays. And now, who would you like to nominate to also send the elevator back down and help aspiring actors and filmmakers make it <laughs> where they are? So someone that you know who is who has already made it and who you think would be willing to share words of wisdom with others? Someone we know personally? Uh, preferably, or maybe someone you just really want to see on the masterclass. That works too. Maybe someone who hasn't had 500 cups of coffee yet with others, but would be willing to maybe have an hour over here sharing wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, someone we know personally, I don't know. I think one one of the other keys to um if not our success, at least our personal happiness is that we've really lived our personal lives outside of Hollywood even mm -hmm. when we, you know, have lived even geographically in yeah. Hollywood. Um but um you know, I would just look to the people who have created some of the stuff that we like to watch um either on television or in the movies these days it's probably a little easier on tv frankly than um the, or streaming um than it is maybe in the movies but uh i loved banshees of Vinna sharon i'd like to, i'd like to see martin mcdonough he's uh he's great um i don't All know right. we'll reach out yeah, yeah great yeah. Don't, don't tell him i said so because we Too don't late. it's gonna be public <laughs> I think that's Maybe a great anyone point. you would like to publicly. I'm going to just piggyback on on Diamond's thing. I love that movie. It was so to me interesting and provocative. And uh, you know, there are getting to be fewer and fewer mo movies each year that you know we watch and we say, "Wow, that's that's the kind of movie that that inspired us to become writers." So when you find one, yeah, uh, I mean that would that would be amazing. I'm sure you know. Um, your your listeners and 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 watchers would would you know absolutely love to hear also you know uh 
a lot of the business now takes place out of the United States. It's a very international business. And um, that's that's very different than when we started. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's hear from some of the voices from places that, you know, that aren't in the United States and uh, that that are just kind of um, creating memorable works of, of, of film that, you know, that appeal to everybody. So yeah, awesome. or maybe don't appeal to everybody. Yeah, we'll reach out overseas as well. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, David, David Diamond, David Weissman, thank you very much. You have been phenomenal and you've shared so much. I'm sorry we didn't get to drink the coffee. I could be the 501 cup, but <laughs> thank you very much. And I'm excited to share it with all our viewers, with all the all the students, professors who are subscribed to our list and to uh, all, not just Pennsylvania because we're, we're sharing it with everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. And you thank you, Maria. Fantastic. It's our pleasure. Thanks for having us.